Hello, and welcome to this session on GiveWell's Current Progress and Priorities with Olivia Larson. I'm Brian, and I'll be the MC for this session. We'll be starting with a 15-minute talk by Olivia, then we'll move on to a live Q&A session where she will respond to some of your questions. You can submit questions using the box to the right-hand side of this video. You can also vote for your favorite questions to push them higher up the list. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this session. Olivia is a philanthropy advisor at GiveWell, helping GiveWell donors decide how to give and keeping them updated on GiveWell's research progress. She's currently on leave from Yale School of Management, where she is pursuing an MBA. While in college, she founded Effective Altruism at Williams, a student group focused on introducing students to tenets of effective giving. Here's Olivia. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, logging on to my talk. I'm Olivia Larson. I'm a philanthropy advisor at GiveWell, and I'm really thrilled to be here speaking at EAG Asia Pacific. Thanks for having me. I wanted to start by uh, telling you a little bit about what GiveWell is, and then we'll chat a little bit about uh, what we're excited about in global health and development, including some grants that we are making in Asia. So as all of you know, effective altruism tries to find the ways that we can do the most good in society. And GiveWell works more narrowly in global health and development on this same question. We work to identify the very few charities that can demonstrably impact the lives of people living in low and lower middle income countries. And so what GiveWell's work looks like in practice is that we spend significant amounts of time every year researching many charities to try to identify the most cost-effective and impactful charities to add to our list of recommended charities. It means that every year when we update our list of recommended charities, anyone who wants to can come to our website, read our recommendations and our reasoning behind why we made them, and if they'd like to, make a donation to support these causes. When people make donations to GiveWell's recommended charities, we pass on 100% of the donation. We ourselves are a nonprofit and we're funded by or we're funded by donors who choose to support GiveWell as an organization. So we're able to pass on 100% of donations made to our recommended charities through us to our recommended charities. And so we use high quality evidence to identify the most cost effective and impactful giving opportunities that work in global health and development trying to most effectively help very poor people that are alive today. This is our list of our current uh, recommended charities. I'm not gonna go through what each one of them does, but as a few examples, the Against Malaria Foundation distributes long lasting insecticide treated mosquito nets to protect people from malaria and give directly, offers one time unconditional cash transfers to very poor people living in six sub-Saharan African countries and Morocco. Most of the work that our recommended charities do is in Sub-Saharan Africa, because that's where a lot of the world's poorest people are. Um, one of our recommended charities works in Asia. It's Deworm the World Initiative. Uh, they're a charity that we recommend based on evidence that we've seen that deworming children when they're young may increase their incomes later in life. Um, about 40% of Deworm the World's funding goes to work in India, uh, with much smaller amounts going both to Pakistan and Vietnam. And the reason that GiveWell recommends all charities that work in lower income countries in global health and development is because that's where we see the opportunity to make the biggest impact. GiveWell started out looking into charities in many different cause areas from New York City job searching to education to global health and development. And we ended up focusing in on charities that are working in low and lower middle income countries for a few reasons. Number one being that many studies are done of programs that work in low income countries and having this evidence can help us more easily connect the program that we can support like malaria nets to the outcome that we want to see like lives saved. Second of all, many of the issues faced by people living in low income countries are a bit simpler or easier to address than those faced by people in rich countries. Um, this is in large part because rich countries have already dedicated a lot of resources to address the problems that are best addressed by resources. As an example, uh, malaria in the United States was eradicated in 1951, but remains endemic in many low-income countries. And so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Malaria Consortium, which is one of GiveWell's recommended charities. 
We recommend Malaria Consortium for their seasonal malaria chemo prevention program. This program works in areas where malaria is highly seasonal by distributing preventative anti-malarial medication to every child under five to protect them from malaria. The idea being, if we can protect them from malaria during the four month long rainy season, they'll be safe from malaria for the whole year. I was actually able to see a Malaria Consortium in action uh, two summers ago when I went to Burkina Faso on a site visit with GiveWell. And it was incredible to see the thousands of public health workers trying to knock on every door in Burkina Faso to see if there were children that uh, needed this preventative medication. Um, but we don't recommend Malaria Consortium just because uh, I had a great time on a site visit there. We recommend Malaria Consortium for its evidence-based, cost-effectiveness, uh, transparency, and room, to, and room for additional funding. Um, in terms of evidence, GiveWell has seen f seven high-quality studies connecting seasonal malaria chemo prevention to reduced rates of malaria. And we also think that Malaria Consortium has a very high cost-effectiveness. We believe they can save a life for between three and four thousand dollars. And this is our all in estimate. It includes costs borne by many different actors and importantly, adjust for the fact that not every child who receives a treatment would otherwise have died from malaria. Very low estimates that you may see other places often just refer to the cost of one treatment. Malaria Consortium also has very strong transparency and shares information with us and we think they'd be able to use additional funds to expand our program very cost effectively. So, as I just mentioned, Malaria Consortium passes GiveWell's very high bar for both evidence of effectiveness and that we can pretty easily connect the program we support to the impact it has and cost effectiveness. Having that impact is pretty cheap. And GiveWell's goal going forward is to increase our cost effectiveness. So we're asking the question, if we look for things that might be more difficult to evaluate in terms of effectiveness, will we be able to find even higher cost effectiveness? And one of the ways that we're looking into this is through technical assistance. And to explain technical assistance, it's uh, helpful to explain our more core direct, direct delivery charities. So for our traditional non-technical assistance charities like the Malaria Consortium, donor funds support all aspects of the program, like buying the medicine, hiring training staff members, and monitoring their work. And we think that that's very cost effective. But we think that some programs may be more cost effective if they're delivered via existing government infrastructure. We call this technical assistance. GiveWell supporting a charity that can then help support a government to improve the services they provide. In the past, we haven't sought out technical assistance work because there's a much less clear line of sight between donor dollars and impact. As an example of clear line of sight in the case of seasonal malaria chemo prevention, we have a pretty good idea exactly how many additional children will be reached with an extra $10,000. We're working with a single organization so we can ask Malaria Consortium how it spent its money, how many children it reached, and we can use that to come up with an estimate of Malaria Consortium's impact and cost effectiveness. On the other hand, in the case of technical assistance, we're trying to model how a charity might affect the government's work to help make more good outcomes happen. So the impact of that charity's actions are affected by a sometimes complex government system with idiosyncrasies that may be hard to predict, like the political climate. So predicting the impact of an individual group or charity in influencing existing government uh, systems is more uncertain by its very nature. But we think that there might be a reservoir of highly cost-effective giving opportunities in this more leveraged technical assistance space that we haven't yet systematically explored. So this year, we've been looking into these types of opportunities a lot more, and we've looked at a lot of different technical assistance projects, and I want to tell you about one in particular, which addresses syphilis in pregnancy. Around a million pregnant people have active syphilis infections each year, and most of those cases are in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. About a third of those pregnancies with active syphilis end in the child's death, and of the children that survive, about a quarter of them have congenital syphilis, which can result in severe deformities and lifelong disability. The good news is that syphilis in pregnancy is treatable with a single injection of penicillin, which is a common medication that costs around 16 cents. And we think this issue is neglected. 
World Health Organization recommends uh, treating syphilis in pregnancy. A few countries have implemented this recommendation and philanthropic funding going for it is extremely limited. This could be because of a lack of awareness of the issue or because of a focus on HIV in pregnancy to the exclusion of other STIs. But it's that very investment in HIV screening and treatment that may now be leveraged to increase the screening and treatment of syphilis in pregnancy. There's a new testing device that allows people to be tested for HIV and syphilis at the same time, with results returned in the same visit. This dual test costs only a little bit more than the HIV only test, and we think that the price will come down soon. And so GiveWell recently funded a charity that we've worked closely with in the past, Evidence Action, to help the government of Liberia switch from HIV only tests to dual tests. Uh, Liberia has a relatively high rate of syphilis and a very high rate of HIV screening and treatment in pregnancy. So supporting Liberia in a switch to this new dual test presents a potentially great opportunity to leverage that HIV testing and treatment infrastructure. Ultimately, Evidence Action thinks it can transition this work to the government in five years. And so our current best guess is that this work may be as cost effective or more cost effective than our recommended charities, but there's a lot of uncertainty that comes with that, much more so than for our direct delivery charities, because the path to impact is much harder to assess. But even taking some probability of failure into account, we think this is likely a very strong giving opportunity. And so we're also considering working with Evidence Action to do a similar type of grant for syphilis screening and treatment uh, for technical assistance work in Indonesia in the future. So uh, definitely keep an eye out for that. Another way that GiveWell has been looking into giving opportunities that may be more cost effective but more difficult to evaluate is through looking into policy advocacy. So for policy advocacy, GiveWell is looking to support charities that help the governments of low-income countries improve their public health policymaking, either by offering technical assistance for legislation or by advocating legislators to pass legislation for basic public health measures, such as alcohol control or lead paint regulation. We think that policy interventions may be good because they have the potential to be really high leverage. A one-time investment could cause a policy to be passed that impacts a whole country's worth of people for a significant period of time. And eventually, ownership could be completely handed off to the government. On the other hand, much like technical assistance, it's much harder to understand the impact and the path to impact. Instead of, for direct delivery, evaluating the impact of something that the charity does, for policy, we're trying to think about how likely it is that a certain policy will pass before the charity got involved and then how that likelihood changed after the charity got involved. So as an example, next up, I'm gonna go into an example of a grant we made. It involves a charitable intervention to decrease suicides. So please skip ahead or pause if you'd prefer not to hear about this. The grant that we made was to address pesticide suicides, which is a common way of attempting suicide in rural agricultural communities. These deaths make up 14% of completed suicides worldwide. Many of these pesticides are very available and very lethal, and a deliberate ingestion may be more lethal than someone attempting suicide might expect. And so to address this, we gave a grant to the Center for Pesticide Suicide Prevention. They work to encourage governments to ban the most lethal pesticides so they're not as available for suicides. We've seen some evidence from Sri Lanka that banning pesticides coincided with pesticide with suicide deaths in general going down. And in 2017, we gave the Center for Pesticide Suicide Prevention a $1.3 million grant to conduct research on the most lethal pesticides in India and Nepal, in hopes that this research would encourage the governments of India and Nepal to ban these pesticides. We haven't yet completed our grant retrospective, and as I mentioned before, causal attribution can be difficult, but we believe that the Center for Pesticide Suicide Prevention has been relatively successful. In 2019, Nepal, one of its two target countries, banned the two pesticides that the Center for Pesticide Suicide Prevention had identified as most lethal. We expect this to save lives and do not expect it to cause a reduction in agricultural output. So while GiveWell is always on the lookout for more cost-effective giving opportunities, we remain incredibly excited about the charities we currently recommend. 
we're still in the very early stages of understanding how technical assistance and policy advocacy charities compare to our core recommendations. So if you ever have any questions about how GiveWell is expanding, our core recommendations, or our process in general, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, my email address is here. Um, I'm on Swapcard, and I'll be available in the future uh, in during the presentation, after the presentation, uh, to uh, answer any questions. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Have a good one. Thank you for that talk, Olivia. So uh, we don't have any questions submitted yet from the audience, so I'll ask you a few of my own. So, uh, but audience members can still ask in if they'd love to. So for these, uh, that now that GiveWell is looking into technical assistance or policy advocacy charities, uh, how does GiveWell plan on uh, framing what type of grants to give these? Uh, I'm assuming that they, these aren't yet at the level of GiveWell's recommended charities. So what does GiveWell plan on doing or granting to these orgs? Yeah, thanks uh, so much, Brian, for that question. And thanks to everyone for uh, logging on. Really appreciate, uh, really appreciate it and looking forward to uh, chatting about this. As GiveWell starts considering more technical assistance and policy advocacy giving opportunities, there are things that might be less clear fits for being on GiveWell's top charity list, in part because many of the things that we uh, want from our recommended charities is the ability to take on kind of arbitrarily large amounts of funding. Um, this idea that if uh, you give to Malaria Consortium, uh, they'll be you know, very likely to be able to use significant amounts of money uh, kind of linearly to uh, increase the amount of uh, anti-malarial medication they're able to give to uh, children. For more of these policy and technical assistance, um, there's more about making a commitment kind of upfront and allowing an organization to start working on a project or start you know, doing advocacy or uh, working with a government for technical assistance, that means that it's might that it might be a better fit for funding opportunity for funding forms like GiveWell incubation grants, which we've used in the past, um, which are basically opportunities for GiveWell to give uh, larger upfront grants that uh, allow us to uh, learn and and make an impact at the same time. Another way that we could fund these, uh, you know, a little bit more risky, but likely still cost-effective giving opportunities is through effective altruism funds. Um, there's an EA fund for global health and development that GiveWell CEO Ellie Hassenfeld runs. And some of the things that he looks for and that he looks for in that include giving opportunities that could be more cost-effective than GiveWell's recommendations, but might be a little bit more uh, speculative, like policy advocacy or technical assistance. Well, so do you think like the money you would be granting through these incubation grants could either would either come from the EA Global Health and Development Fund or from maybe bigger funders like OpenPhil? Is that correct? Yes, definitely. So uh, the places right now uh, that we fund uh, through these things would be EA funds, uh, larger funders like Open Philanthropy or other uh, large funders that uh, we are able to work with and uh, have relationship with, relationship with there. Um, one of the things that we've uh, considered and that could be on the horizon uh, in the future would be having a sort of policy or technical assistance fund that uh, would you know, operate a little bit like the EA funds in which people could donate on GiveWell's website, and then we could use it for different uh, types of policy or technical assistance funding opportunities. All right. Yeah. So there's now a question from the audience. So. Uh, uh, so it's awesome to hear that GiveWell is expanding to include policy advocacy, but are there risks of political backlash of a Western or international NGO influencing national policy? Uh, and it feels this is less risky for public health, but how is GiveWell taking into account these risks? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good question. And it's something that we are definitely thinking about. Um, I think that uh, you know, your sense about uh, public health policy being a good place to uh, be there um, in that we're advocating for things that we really think will uh, help people in a hopefully relatively uh, un uncontroversial way, as well as partnering with uh, organizations that have more local understanding than GiveWell does. GiveWell is based in Oakland, California. Um, we don't have as strong a sense as we would want to um, of, you know, the political climate of many of the countries that we would uh, do tech that we would kind of work with policy advocacy on. 
Um, but if we're able to partner with a charity that has more of that local knowledge and relationships, I think that's more likely to uh, be successful. Another uh, kind of important thing that we think about sometimes there is about how for many of the uh, policy advocacy things that we're working on, it wouldn't necessarily be a give well and a, you know, Western based nonprofit uh, being the only uh, organization or being the only funder of this uh, of this policy advocacy. Um, so in the case of something like tobacco taxation, you can think about there being tobacco uh, companies that are kind of doing similar things of policy advocacy, but kind of in the other direction. So that's another, uh, another framing that can sometimes be helpful in thinking about uh, those types of things like uh, tobacco control, tobacco taxation and alcohol control, which is another area that we're uh, working in or considering. All right, so the next question from Sally, uh, there are many standout charities that almost meet top charity criteria. Do you actively work with standout charities to help them become top charities so there will be more top charities to donate to? And maybe if not, then why so? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we're really glad to have our uh, standout charities on the list. Um, and we're always, you know, want to uh, consider the potential of those coming to be seen as more cost effective. Often, if there is something that is a standout charity, it's because we've reviewed it in some depth and think that it's relatively unlikely to reach the level of cost effectiveness as our recommended charities. So for many of our standout charities, one of the uh, reasons that we didn't uh, end up making them a top charity was because of, uh, you know, the evidence base not showing uh, enough cost effectiveness or us not having the uh, capacity to really uh, understand the, the chain um, that they can use to make an impact. So for the latter with uh, us, you know, wanting to have a stronger sense of how to make an impact, that's something that we definitely could, you know, invest more time and energy in to make some of our standout charities top charities. Um, and for others that might be just not quite reaching the bar of cost effectiveness yet, um, that's something that, uh, you know, seems much, a little bit more difficult to uh, change, but um, as new evidence comes in on these, uh, on these types of giving opportunities, we continue to uh, reevaluate that. Um, one thing that we did for one of our standout charities, which is Dispensers for Safe Water, which puts uh, chlorination stations near uh, places where people get water so that they can clean their water. Um, Last year, I believe it was then, but it might have been a different year, we uh, funded an extension of a study for dispensers for safe water so we could get more information about the connection between uh, these chlorination stations and uh, child mortality and uh, diarrheal deaths. And so uh, based on, depending on uh, how that evidence plays out, that could be something that uh, could be really cost effective and allow us to uh, move that to our list of recommended charities. So we're and yeah. kind of we funded mm -hmm. that research and we're really uh, interested in uh, continuing to help under continuing to help us understand and fund toward the understanding of those types of questions. Yeah, and so I see two questions now that relate to each other. So uh, there's a question on is global health more constrained by funding or talent? And I know that GiveWell's top charities still have a lot of funding gaps. And so there's a next question, which is. Why do you think it is that the funding gaps of established recommended charities haven't been filled by major international aid funds yet? And has GiveWell reached out to these? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, many of the uh, large international aid funders are already doing a lot in these areas. Um, there just kind of is such a huge need. Um, and those uh, organizations often uh, either, cre either create their budget uh, and then kind of give within that budget or um, in other cases, there are other political concerns or other types of things that would allow them or that wouldn't allow them to do the things that, uh, you know, you well might think would be uh, would be the most cost effective. And so, excuse me, based on those, uh, you know, considerations, um, it's really not, it's not super surprising to us that uh, these large, uh, very cost effective funding gaps remain, um, because different people are looking at different types of uh, different considerations when they're choosing where to fund. Um, and there is just, you know, so much room for more funding and these large, this large need for basic things like uh, malaria nets um, that it's uh, particularly, uh, particularly important for us to keep uh, 
fundraising and trying to fill those gaps where we can. Yeah. And then do you want to talk a bit more about the funding constraint versus talent constraint? Like, do you think GiveWell is still finding it hard to hire specific uh, uh, roles like senior researchers? Or is it like, okay, it's just we need more funding for these top charities? Yeah, we're just definitely uh, both. Um, so we're always really looking for people to join the team, particularly senior researchers that have a really strong understanding of causal inference and can help us both uh, you know, continue evaluating and find new direct delivery top charities, as well as expand the scope of the types of things that GiveWell recommends and think about those tough questions of causality. Um, so that's something that's really important and we're really, we'd be really excited for uh, more people to apply and us to uh, be able to find those people that have uh, that expertise. Um, at the same time, uh, we have found these hundreds of millions of dollars of unfilled uh, funding gaps and so are really excited for people to uh, contribute there. Uh, so it's, uh, it's definitely both and they're, they're very connected. As we get more funding, uh, we need more talent so that we can find more funding gaps to fill. As we use more talent to find better funding cap funding gaps, we need more funding to uh, fill those. All right, yeah, so that's all the time we have. Thank you everyone for your questions and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. Thank you, Olivia. Thanks so much for having me, bye.